Good evening. I'm Professor Sarah Churchwell, Chair of Public Understanding of the Humanities and Director of the Being Human Festival at the University of London School of Advanced Study. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our discussion tonight. Please be aware that this event is being recorded, including the Q&A session. So please note that any question you ask and the answer will form part of the recording and it will subsequently be made available online. You can ask your question anonymously if you choose by ticking the anonymized box before submitting a question. If you would like to have captions on, please press the CC subtitling icon on your toolbar. Please note that the chat function is closed for this event, but we will be having a Q&A later with our speakers. For this, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom. There should be an icon for this in your toolbar, and you're free to start asking your questions as soon as you think of them. This is the first event in our Being Human in Conversation series for 2021, and it's based around our festival theme for this year, Renewal. For this year's festival, we are interested in exploring the many ways in which the humanities can help us to renew the world around us in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, most obviously, but also following the new relationship between Britain and Europe after Brexit, the new administration in the United States, and the ongoing challenges of the global climate emergency, to name just a few of the most obvious challenges facing us all today. If you would like to get involved, please take a look at our website, which is at beinghumanfestival.org forward slash apply. And I think it's just been put in the chat. If you want to tweet about tonight's event or the festival in general, you can find us at beinghumanfest and please use the hashtag beinghuman2021. We are thrilled to be in conversation tonight with some new generation thinkers, a scheme sponsored by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the BBC, and supported by the Being Human Festival, that each year works with early career researchers in the humanities to cultivate the skills to communicate their research findings to those outside the academic community, which is very much our hymn book at Being Human as well. Our topic tonight, following on from our broad uh, topic this year of renewal, is renewing and rebuilding. COVID-19 has highlighted afresh the divides that exist in our societies. It has thrown a spotlight on class, race, and wealth inequalities, and its underlying divisions between old and young, climate change campaigners and deniers, and even the nations of the UK. Against this backdrop, there has never been a more important time for researchers of all types to enter the public debate, to make their voices heard, to speak up and speak out. It's a time for big ideas. How do we start to rethink our world? How might we refresh and renew our understanding of what it means to be human? How might we ultimately be better humans? We have a great panel this evening. What I'm going to do is ask each of them to speak to this set of ideas um, for two minutes, and I'll ask them to stick to time. And then we'll have um, a bit more of a conversation before opening things up to the Q&A. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Christina Fryer. She is a historian of modern Britain, the British Empire, and the modern Caribbean. She leads the first taught MA at a British university in Black British history at Goldsmiths University of London. Her research interests include global sports and race, as well as language politics in modern Britain, the British Empire, and the British Commonwealth. So uh, over to you, Dr. Christina Fryer. Sorry, Dr. Christina Fryer, heaven's sake. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and thank you all for uh, for being here. Um, so, in uh, in my two minutes, what I wanted to talk about is some of the uh, is some of the research that I've been working on over the past several years, which uh, is quite uh, pertinent to the moment that we're in. Um, and I've been working on uh, a series of disasters and crises in uh, Jamaica during the post-emancipation period. So. Um, after the abolition of slavery from the 1840s to uh, the early 1910s. And part of my interest in this, uh, in this subject um, is thinking about the ways that uh, disasters uh, highlight the underlying assumptions um, and political values of a society. Uh, and so I see this in, in, in my own work in terms of the ways that um, British colonial officials and missionaries and, uh, and um, 
observers, but of course also uh, freed people in Jamaica are thinking about the uh, new societies that are emerging after emancipation. And there are um, two things that, I, that, that come out of this research and also come out of disaster studies more broadly um, that, I, that I've been thinking about uh, in this particular moment. Uh, the first is a kind of wariness around the idea of opportunity. Um, and so in the wake of disaster, when people are thinking about opportunities, um, I'm always a little bit wary. Who is seizing those opportunities uh, and why are they seizing them? Um, and who benefits and who isn't going to benefit uh, from these opportunities? And then the other thing that I think about, and there's been no greater example of this than, uh, than COVID-19 uh, in the moment that we're in, um, is the extent to which disasters are social events as opposed to purely natural ones. So they tell us a lot about our society um, and, and how we are going to uh, rebuild is a social problem in addition to being a, uh, a, a, a in addition to being uh, a natural uh, or environmental concern as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Dara McGee, who is a sociologist based at the University of Bath where he traces our shifting cultural attitudes towards gambling and the role of social class in shaping the popularity of gambling historically. Dara also looks at the way smartphone technologies are transforming young people's relationship with online gambling today. So uh, Dara, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, and thank you to the Being Human Festival uh, for bringing us together today. Um, as Sarah's indicated, I am uh, Dr. Dara McGee from the University of Bath. Uh, and I have a sense of imposter syndrome here this evening already um, as a primarily uh, sociologically trained uh, social scientist. Um, I don't often find myself in the company, company of the humanities. Um, and as I'll talk a little bit about in the next two minutes, I increasingly find myself at the interface between the social sciences and public health. Uh, but I think one of the, the introductory comments I want to make tonight is that I think the social scientists social science and the humanities have never been closer together. And, and I think perhaps in, in thinking about renewing and rebuilding, I, I think perhaps one of the, the academic uh, impacts of COVID uh, and, and related events is that it's, it's made us realize how important collaboration is. Um, as Sarah's indicated, my research critically explores the changing cultural signification of, of, of gambling today and what many herald to be a, a digital age. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in how the advent of, of smart technologies I think those associated with the Silicon Valley, uh, how they've reshaped attitudes towards gambling, uh, particularly among a younger generation who hold in their pockets more cutting edge uh, computing technology than entire industries had uh, just a generation or perhaps a decade ago. Um, as you can imagine, much of this research uh, is situated or, or might be positioned as a counter narrative to kind of tech utopia discourses, uh, the kind of which we see, uh, we've seen uh, quite rightly during the, the COVID uh, year that we've had, but also we see more broadly in healthcare, education uh, and economics. Um, I approach this kind of technological revolution in a global frame, uh, just commenced a new and a very exciting project funded by the British Academy Youth Futures Programme um, that adopts a participatory action research approach, uh, so very much in keeping with our discussions tonight. Uh, to understanding youth gambling in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to be working with colleagues in Ghana and Malawi and bringing together disciplines in humanity, social sciences, uh, and public health. Um, and I think that's perhaps one of the, the key things that we can discuss tonight is, is this acute appreciation of the need for more constructive and creative dialogue uh, between the humanities and public health, uh, a recurring theme at the forefront of public consciousness over the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Um, and indeed, yeah, I think that's a really important theme for us to um, pick up on. Our next speaker is Dr. Tom Scott Smith, Associate Professor of Refugee Studies and Forced Migration at the University of Oxford. As a former aid worker, Tom is particularly interested in the paradoxes of aid, focusing on how humanitarians respond to basic human needs and negotiate political disputes. He is now writing a book on disaster shelter, studying seven attempts to provide emergency accommodation to refugees since 2015. So Tom, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And thanks um, again for inviting me and the rest of the panelists to this event. 
On the face of it, my research isn't really about renewing and rebuilding at all, because it's focused on disasters themselves and about how people deal with crisis in that emergency phase. And I write particularly about humanitarians as a particular group of people whose professional job it is, of course, to frame these problems in certain ways, to define basic needs in certain ways. And I'm particularly interested in the way that they uh, have very technocratic and standardized systems, both now and in the past, that lead to all sorts of dilemmas. Um, when aid agencies are short of cash, when they're stretching political will to breaking point, when they have immediate needs to attend to, you get all these classic political dilemmas about resources and how they're allocated. But it probably comes as no surprise to say that this phase of any humanitarian crisis very quickly leads to much bigger utopian ideas about what happens next. And very often these ideas are embedded in how humanitarians are thinking about the crisis itself. I mean, it probably goes without saying also that crises are pretty much always seen as opportunities of one kind or another. And as Christina says, the question is really, who is seizing them? And the issue that interests me particularly is about also how these opportunities are being framed. So how a particular agenda of reform gains traction after an emergency and a narrative emerges about what went wrong and how we fix it. These narratives can be hugely influential. I and mean, I think it was Bruno Latour who said that we don't often think about how things really operate until they break down. And then when they do break down, the story of what went wrong all depends on crafting a convincing narrative to bring people along with you in the process of building alliances. And I think there's lots to learn from history in particular about the narratives that have been created in the past in the wake of crisis and the successes that they have had. And I'm thinking particularly about a project that I'm working on at the moment, funded by the Levy Hume Trust, which is to write a biography of a man called John Boyd Orr, who was the first director of the Food and Agricultural Organization at the United Nations, and a fascinating figure who used the subsistence crises at the end of World War II as a way to launch some hugely ambitious ideas onto the world stage. And for me, the interesting part of his story is not so much the schemes themselves, but rather the way he went about trying to convince people of the need for change. We all know that this was a moment post 1945 when lots of radical ideas were indeed uh, accepted. And there are lessons there about strategy, about seizing opportunity, about appealing across political divisions to create common ground. And no doubt we'll come about, uh, come around to this uh, later. But my great fear about the outcome of this pandemic is that despite the fact that it demonstrates more than anything else how health has to be a shared endeavour and that there needs to be international cooperation on these matters, there seems to have been, if anything, a, a fragmentation around the central narrative, a whole load of different ideas about what went wrong and where we go. And I think that by looking into the past, we can certainly learn something about the political strategies used to get certain narratives accepted. Anyway, I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, and then our uh, final panelist this evening is Dr. Christine Zain Yao, who is currently a lecturer in early and 19th century American literature at University College London. She researches topics such as race science, feminist fashion, queer tarot, and anti-racist practices. She co-hosts a podcast, PH Divas, which interviews women from across the STEM humanities divide about their research and experiences of working in academia. So uh, Zine, please uh, give us your starting thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. And may I echo everyone else and say, it's a real pleasure to be invited here and to be in conversation with other brilliant think thinkers from my new gen cohort. So my work um, is, contrarian, that if the, the topics we're discussing today are renewing and rebuilding, I sort of see the humanities as giving us a resource to, to question what those things are and to validate the, the need for contrarian and counterintuitive approaches, that even though we want to turn to the progressive narratives of, of, of change, I share the skepticism of so many of my colleagues here today and question like what sort of good feelings are as motivating these desires for change, which in and themselves can be dangerous. 
And so in my work, I particularly look at unfeeling, that is sort of queer racialized forms of unfeeling as a kind of defiance to the usual ways that we think about, you know, sympathy operating to create, um, to create social change. And so my work in the 19th century particularly looks at unfeeling because it's the opposite of how we think of the period that, of course, we think about the, the great um, social, social problems of the era, such as um, chattel slavery, indigenous dispossession, um, Chinese exclusion, as needing the corrective of people from that minoritized community having to prove to, uh, to the dominant populations that they are worthy of being human and being accepted, et cetera, et cetera. And yet what I trace are all these sort of threads of dissent that even though we see this as the dominant model for change, and indeed the way that we very justify the study of humanities and the study of literature is always about making the right type of feeling. What does it mean to give space for these forms of dissent, dissatisfaction, or as I call in my book, um, disaffection? And with disaffection, I'm using this as a word that most means like disaffection in the political sense, but also as in the opposite of affect and feeling. Um, and so I'm really interested in making space for, for these uh, seemingly negative or even antisocial terms because I think it's important to not just simply allow the desire for uh, change in a positive way to go in a way that's um, unquestioned and to sort of consider what are we rebuilding towards? Is it rebuilding the old or are we truly taking the opportunity to think about renewal and resurgence beyond the, um, the existing frameworks that we have? And in closing, I'd just like to quote from um, Audre Lorde's famous essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, which I think is very relevant. That of course her critique particularly is about feminism and particularly white feminism from her perspective as a black queer woman. And her point from the very title of it um, that I think is very relevant to this conversation about rebuilding is what does it mean to dismantle the master's house with the tools that have created the, the house of the master? And in that um, same way, I have to say that, that what tools do we then use to rebuild what is going to be in that place? Or what other sort of buildings can we think about? Or maybe can we shift away from thinking about um, those narratives and who has to be a master altogether? Um, and so I hope that that provocation uh, will be ins inspiring and spark some conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'll invite all of the uh, panelists to turn on uh, your videos and we'll join, come back together in the virtual space. Um, and um, thank you all uh, very much for that. I feel like I just kind of want to, to st if, if we weren't on Zoom, I would just kind of try to withdraw to the background and let you guys just have at it because I think the, the themes there were so strong and I'd like you just to have the conversation, but um, I think Zoom probably won't quite permit that free flowing um, discussion that, um, that we would um, like to have. So um, I wonder um, if one way of framing it um, and it's looking at the, the shared themes in many of, uh, of what you were talking about, I mean, some very strong themes um, come through there, the importance of collaboration the importance of intervening in the narratives as they emerge, but also received wisdoms, um, overturning those, um, thinking about the ways in which there are, um, society wants, often wants simplistic answers to complex problems. So I think those are, um, those are the, some of the um, shared themes that, that, um, that I heard. Um, but I wonder also if we might start with one other question for each of you. Um, which is sometimes this, this conversation, and speaking about you know, intervening in the narrative, right? Sometimes this conversation about renewal and, and rebuilding is framed in this, um, this new slogan, build back better, um, the three Bs, right? And of course, one of the things that, that the humanities um, do and the social sciences, Dar, I'll say so that you don't feel um, that, you, I don't want you to have imposter syndrome, um, is to encourage us to put pressure on that final word there, that value judgment um, better. People are talking about building back better, but, you, but in, in my view anyway, that we aren't asking hard enough questions about what does better mean? Um, and so I wonder if each of you could speak from uh, briefly from the perspective of your own discipline, um, maybe your own research you know, specialism if you choose, but also if you want to broaden it out in terms of your disciplinary background. Um, what does that make you think 
um, about how we think about better and how we can approach that question. And then let's see if that can open out some of these questions about um, intervening in the narrative. Um, so I, I have no particular order. Does somebody want to jump in and, and um, raise their hand and go first? Um, we also, uh, we seem to have lost Tom. I, oh no, sorry, we haven't lost Tom. There you are, sorry, he'd be fine. I, I, you, you're there, I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, does, um, so would anybody like to, to, um, to speak to that or shall I? Shall I choose? Shall I choose someone? Uh, I I don't mind sp speaking to it. I mean, partly because building back better is one of these slogans that has existed for years and years in humanitarian aid, and I think it's an interesting one because it's often used as a way uh, to take responsibility for human welfare away from states and international organisations and place them back onto individuals in the private sector. So it, so, so it already is filled with all sorts of political content. And I think it's actually a good example of that point I was trying to make about how the real issue is not the need for renewal itself or the building back better, but it's the narrative that we craft about what renewal means. I mean, I suppose that's precisely the point you were making, Sarah, as well. But in humanitarian aid, that idea of building back better has often been used alongside the notion of resilience. We might come on to that, but that's another buzzword. And building resilience has often meant accepting, in effect, that state welfare can't protect people from shocks and disasters and trying to build up people's own capacity to help themselves. Um, and that's not really the kind of optimistic narrative of increased state capacity and investment in, in welfare and infrastructure that I would buy into. Um, but it does show the power of a narrative and how that it does uh, take over and, uh, and sits underneath a certain number of policy buzzwords. And I suppose that for me, the role of scholarship is precisely to contextualize those kind of visions and pull out what is going on uh, underneath these seemingly innocuous phrases. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, what about what about the rest of you? What do you think that your um, how does your discipline make you think about the question of what it will mean to if we want to build back better? What is this better that we're talking about? I mean, I'm happy to to, to jump in here um, in part because you know, and I, and I really liked what Zion said earlier about the humanities um, being a way of asking questions and and sort of pausing as as these slogans sort of get trotted out and, and asking what's what's really going on. Um, and for me, thinking about um, the sort of insights from disaster studies, you know, the question about better is always better for whom, better than what, um, who is determining what constitutes better, who is, you know, who, whose voices are, are being heard. Um, and one of the things that we see time and time again um, in, in the responses to disasters, both um, in, you know, it, both further back in times so of the 19th century, but, you know, even something like uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, which, which, you know, Hurricane Katrina happened to inspire a number of the disaster studies scholars of my generation. So it is this moment that, that we often think about uh, and that we, we often, um, was at the forefront of our minds is that you know the black people of New Orleans were not really involved in the decision making about what New Orleans should be after that uh, after that catastrophe, and so in similar ways to what uh, Tom was just speaking about, um, you know even with the sort of New Orleans public school system, which was you know sort of heavily um, heavily privatized in, in certain ways uh, by the state, um, without much consideration of what New Orleans families might want uh, those schools to to look like. So you know in thinking about uh, the kinds of work that I do. And thinking about Black history, I'm always sort of wondering um, in, in, in situations where this is applicable, um, are Black people involved in these in this decision making or are decisions being, is the better being determined for them, um, particularly in moments, and this is the case with COVID-19, uh, where Black people have been most affected or, or uh, have been heavily and disproportionately affected by these disasters, and yet they're not disproportionately involved in the determining of what is better. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, um, I, I, all of these are going to make me want to say things, but I need to, I, I, I'm deferring. So, um, so Zion, can you say something about how you see literature or American literature, if you want to be specific, which is also my field, so I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. Um, how do you, what do you think literature brings to, um, to this question about, um, about, about what better might look like? Well, I think that um, the complaint that we get from students so often when we're marking their papers is like, oh, but literature is so subjective. The essay writing is so subjective. 
And that which seems to be like the very weakness of our field of study is in fact, in this case, a strength, I think, precisely because it sort of falls outside um, the metrics of evaluation in terms of good and bad in a way that can, can't be like mapped on in any sort of concrete way. You can give someone a grading rubric, but you can't actually say like, this is what a good essay is gonna look like on T.S. Eliot or Toni Morrison every single time, right? And it's because of that sort of, I think the frustration that inspires, but then the creativity from it, I think is an important effective response. That is not simply about returning turning to literature as a simple ethnographic um, window into a type of reality, especially when you're reading literature by a minoritized subjects um, in order to gain knowledge. It's actually about staying with complexity, staying with problems in a way that should challenge us. And I think that this is also something that literature needs to really push back on that, of course, humanities and literary studies in particular is very embattled because of you know, governmental narratives about what education matters, which is STEM, STEM, STEM. And like, they're like, what does literature have possibly have to do? And I think the first thing we turn to is the thing that I'm pushing against, which is, but literature helps us to understand people better. And I think as part of that, that also means that we have to realize that literature can also help us see how we don't understand the way that, um, even though we have a desire for understanding and transparency, how might literature have helped us understand opacity and incompatibility in ways that, don't necessarily adhere to how we think about um, narratives of making things better in a simplistic way. And I think that part of what my work wants to do is again, sort of push against the way that literature tends to be mobilized as seeing this is a good representation, this is a bad representation in a very sort of binary fashion. That of course we want to attend to the ethics of who is writing to whom and for whom, but that in itself does not determine the capacity for what literature is, is capable of doing. And I think that, yeah, the space for that sort of unruly nature of literature is really important in terms of breaking down what a better can really constitute. Mm, great, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, Dara, you were talking about, um, I mean, you, you um, also got at this uh, question about uh, simplistic frameworks, right, and talking about tech utopias, um, this idea that there might be this kind of, you know, one size fits all solution. Um, so um, I wonder what, what better means from the point of view of the research that you're doing as you try to resist those utopias. What, what, is a, what does a better version look like? Yeah, absolutely. When I, when I think of Build Back Better and I cast my memory back over the last year, the, the discourses that come to mind right away are, are largely of a, a kind of a, a digital interface between technology and the economy. And, and, and in, in particular, thinking about narratives of progress, uh, innovation. Uh, we've heard so much about the enabling, democratizing power of technology. Um, quite, quite rightly, in many cases, you know, we, we in many ways, this was a, a, a pandemic. This was a crisis that was channeled through technology, be it, you know, the democratizing of access to education for millions of young people at schools and universities. Events of this kind wouldn't have been imaginable just a few years ago, uh, but also in enabling vast numbers of people to work from home and, and thereby mitigate the scale of the economic crisis faced um, but I'm led to question or I'm led to questions uh, in line with with my three panelists and and I think there's a, a disorientation in these moments of crisis um, wherein there's an urgency to rebuild already we're here in discourses about building the economy and, and recovering the economy uh, as fast as possible and, and of course this is an economy which is now founded on big data and surveillance capitalism, much of which over the last year we've been asked to consent to in ways perhaps that we neither understand nor, nor have had to previously. And so there's been an entrenchment of, of technologies in our lives, technologies that for the most part we don't understand. Um, it's, a, it's an interface that is, is by no means natural. And, and my great fear about this uh, build back better is that the question of what are we consenting to when we think about that interface between technology and an economy, um, because of course the discourse is there about uh, progress and, and innovation, but in reality, I think the questions we need to be asking are questions of inequality and power. Oh, great, thank you. Um, I'm I'm reminded as as you're all speaking about um, not just the the inadequacy of um, 
of narratives that are too simplistic for, I love Zion, your word unruly in this context, which I think is absolutely um, exactly right. These kind of unruly realities and then these attempt to fit them into these very simplistic and utopian frameworks as we've been saying, but also sometimes the narratives are just wrong, right? Um, and even just made up, right? So I'm thinking in particular of behavioral fatigue, which actually, you know, if you everybody will remember was this kind of catchphrase that drove um, the government's uh, policy around holding back lockdown and this idea that there would be behavioral fatigue that there was absolutely no evidence for, right? I mean, it was just completely plucked out of the air. Um, and so I'm wondering as well what we can do to, um, how, how does our understanding of narrative and our way, uh, are these different ways of thinking about the ways that these narratives shape this? Um, or another way of actually, I guess, of asking the question is, is so, so how, how do we resist these narratives? We do it in our own work. We do it through publishing. We do it through these conversations. We know that, but in terms of thinking about, you know, all of you are, are here in a sense, because you also work with the media, you want to have conversations um, beyond the academy. Um, and, um, and as, as I said at the beginning, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're all invested in doing here. So, what are the what are the new ideas? What's the next thing that we need to be doing in order to bring this understanding of narrative and intervene in these conversations um, that we aren't doing now? And it's a big question, but I think it's really kind of to me anyway. Sixty-four thousand dollar question is, you know, we have all this expertise over here and it's not getting heard there. And how do we how do we open up these conversations in ways that might be constructive? Yeah, Zai. Sorry, I'm not really sure. I feel like I'm in class, but I also I'm sorry. I know, I know. Nobody knows how to. It's do It's always this. difficult because we don't want to talk over each other. Um, I guess so one thing that I think is is really challenging is that we're we're turning to do this sort of public facing work because we have expertise. But the difficulty is like when we do that in a way that's simply about giving our knowledge to people, we're not giving people the school the tools that we need. And in fact, like what I've been trying to think of doing um, with some of the recent stuff that we all have our BBC essays coming out. So people should take a look on our BBC Radio 3 for all the great stuff coming from us or on the podcast. But anyways, like part of what at least I'm doing is not simply about giving people a, a, a lesser known history of anti-Chinese sentiment at the turn of the last century and some writing about it. But I'm also trying to model a way of thinking and a model way of approaching narrative and thinking um, through and again against in ways that's perhaps seem counterintuitive. And so I think that what we're, we're doing is not simply trying to give people expertise or knowledge, but as if we're just simply handing down these to people, but we are trying to empower people to realize how they are active participants in terms of creating knowledge and navigating knowledge for themselves. At least that's how I, I view it. Mm. And that's, that's very much consistent with what Christina was saying too, isn't it, about, you know, with Katrina and that example of this kind of idea that expertise would be parachuted into communities without actually uh, listening to the communities and understanding their own um, their own expertise in their own unruly realities um, and thinking about that. Um, does it, uh, do we have any other thoughts about because uh, I think it's such a big question and I feel you know and I feel like it's still the barrier that that we all know is the barrier that we need to break down um, and and yet it's as if we keep kind of you know attempting the same strategies which are which are so far um, of limited efficacy, right? I mean, they are, um, as um, as a couple of you noted in your in your opening remarks. I mean, the, um, and you know, Zain, you, you you said it too that the, the, the humanities and literature are in crisis in various ways because of this narrative that STEM will solve everything, that the tech utopia will will do it. We're all out here saying that's not right, that's not right, um, and yet that message doesn't cut through. So, what? How do we take our, our expertise in the humanities in c communication and trying to shape narratives? and figure out how to cut through, um, do we think? Does anybody have any? I basically, I'm, I want you all to solve the problem, please. Oh, Tom, good, you can solve the problem. Great. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to make maybe the, 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 the different point, which is that part of the issue here is the pressure to come up with the big idea. And our currency is often nuanced. You know, this is exactly what Zoyn was saying. It's, it's destabilizing these big ideas. And I think the best tool we have in injecting nuance into conversations where people do get carried away with the all encompassing framework is to point at, at previous examples of when it's gone wrong. And for me anyway, um, I look into the history of humanitarian relief. Um, it's an industry which is very, very bad at looking at its past because 
well, partly because there's a big turnover in humanitarian employees, humanitarian workers are very young and then they get older and they move on, partly because institutional memory is very weak, and partly just because the industry is launching from crisis to crisis without ever really reflecting. But if you look back, there's very often been catastrophic grand narratives about what's gone wrong, particularly, let's say, about um, hunger and, and, and famine. I'm thinking in particular of the high modernist moment in the 1960s where it was perceived that there was a global protein shortage and that was at the, at the root of so much malnutrition and that therefore the solution was to gear up protein production in huge factories basically to grow protein in vats on algae or on oil or take green leaves from trees and process it into new protein sources and but these kind of all encompassing frameworks ended up going down extremely badly because nobody consulted the people who actually had to eat the food, um, which kind of goes without saying very often. But an enormous amount can, can be learned from those kind of examples where you do point out the nuances and you do point out the way that these things unfolded. Um, but often that's not the most attractive. You know, when, when people want the big bang idea, it's, it's not particularly um, uh, 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 good just to, to point out how complicated things are. Yeah, I'm going to try um, and, and combine yeah, please, what what uh, what Zion and, and and Tom have just said, um, in part because I you know it's difficult. I, I think you know part of what we're talking about is the difficulty of uh, of sharing with the public, and I wonder if the question is less about sharing as as opposed to you know starting conversations uh, with with the public in the same way that um, that Zion was was, was suggesting. Um, and there were two moments um, over. Uh, particularly in, in the first maybe four or five months of, of, of the pandemic, um, where I was just sort of fascinated by these questions that I couldn't answer, but that I thought were really important for us to think about. Um, the first one sort of ties in with what Dara's been talking about in terms of you know, tech utopias and the real question of how Zoom beat out Skype and other platforms. And then you know, suddenly we were all on, on, on Zoom. When Zoom was a platform I was familiar with via, for very weird reasons, but nonetheless was familiar with, uh, via the sort of uh, MLM phenomenon in the U.S. because a lot of MLMs were using um, were using uh, Zoom for uh, their sort of uh, calls to try to get people to, to to sign up, and so that question of how a platform just sort of, that that few people had used suddenly like raced past, I'm trying to avoid puns here, raced past the uh, the platform that we were all fairly familiar with and had been using uh, for some time, raises so many questions about the things that Dara was talking about, consent, uh, also, you know, the idea of preparing for these things, well, Skype thought they were prepared, and <laughs> we're not, we're not having this conversation on Skype. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's, you know, I've sort of talked about that a little bit on Twitter, and sort of the, the questions about that, I don't have clear answers, but just sort of sort of thinking through these questions out loud and in the public, I think is really important. Um, and the second thing that I am still uh, obsessed with, um, and I have some theories, but I will not, uh, I'll not um, give them here, uh, is why masks took off in the United States, uh, which is where I'm from, uh, and did not take off quite as much here in the UK. Um, and if you had asked me, you know, 18 months ago, which country was going to have mask, higher mask compliance, I would not have said the United States. Um, and so that gets us into questions of sort of national cultures, uh, the way we're thinking about, the way we're, you know, relating to governments um, that aren't, again, there's no simple answer there. But I think thinking through those questions out loud and with the public, um, you know, my theories could be wrong. Um, but I, I, I think those are sort of walking through these conversations um, is a way to bring our expertise, maybe not our subject expertise or our content expertise, but the sort of our critical faculties um, and, and working through them in a public way. Thank you, yeah. Um, Dara, do you wanna come in there? Is that, are, uh, are you, very, in? very briefly, Sarah, but in many ways to say that it is a stifling, difficult question um, and one I think that we all confront in different ways and in different fields. Um, it's particularly difficult because I think a couple of years ago, you know, there was a real buzz around social media and the way in which social media allowed academics to step beyond the, the, the ivory tower, uh, perhaps cut through some of the noise on particular issues and, and create a space for not only direct, you know, exchange and dialogue, but also kind of that nuance that Tom's discussing. Um, but I think we've we've probably moved beyond that moment as well, and 
I can only speak for myself. You know, I can barely bring myself to go on Twitter these days. It's um, a difficult space now. And, and and not only that, but we have, of course, expert fatigue, uh, if not kind of anti-expert uh, kind of movements out there. And so you find yourself uh, really in a difficult position. I, I think the... The one thing I will say is I think we've got to go beyond a, a politics of denunciation. I, I think in order to speak to publics, in order to um, strike a chord and to gain traction beyond the academia today, and, and, and as a result of that, you know, challenge and, and critically kind of intervene in narratives, I think we've got to go beyond denunciation towards kind of constructive narratives that, that are accessible. Um, the medium for those I'm not so clear about anymore, but it's got to lie in collaboration and more creative ways of, I think, as uh, Zaina said, a model, you know, modeling ways of thinking. I, I think we've actually got to model forms of communication um, increasingly. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that it's one of the things that, to my mind, um, researchers across all of the disciplines, across the spectrum, of, of research um, we all share is that is that our job in you know people tend to think that we're at, we're out there becoming experts to in order to have the answers and of course we all know that what we're trying to do is to ask better questions and that that's what all researchers are learning how to do is how to ask the right questions how to ask those questions that will disrupt and complicate in all of the ways um, that you guys have been talking about um, we do have some questions from the audience, so um, I'm going to uh, give them their say as well, of course. Um, the first question is anonymous, and um, it is um, uh, the question is directed to the whole panel, so I won't ask each of you to answer because we don't necessarily have that much time, but kind of whoever feels that they have an answer, um, please feel free to jump in. So um, the question is, during times of disaster, humans naturally support each other in order to survive. When the pandemic settles, what do you think will be the major sustainable changes in human behavior that will really change society for the next decade or two? I think the difficult word in there is sustainable, I was going to say, um, because it's very easy to come up with all sorts of ways in which human behavior might well change. And not just in the short term by changing the way that we probably shop and the way that we probably work. Um, but whether or not these are things that we want, whether or not they're sustainable things that are, are going to be good for the world, I think is a, a slightly different matter. I mean, um, it probably goes without saying that one of the effects of the pandemic is to treat human proximity suddenly as a risk. And um, for me, I work a lot on borders and on refugee issues, and it's incredible to see how suddenly um, the power of the nation state to close down borders and prevent uh, people from arriving has suddenly become particularly clear and all of the, the debates that we were having after 2015 about humanitarian visas and safe and legal routes for um, asylum seekers to come to states just seem to have been closed down very quickly so i think it's the word sustainable that i find hard i mean when i think about the way that human human behavior has changed it doesn't necessarily strike me as positive Does anyone else want to come in on that? Christina, you also work in disaster studies. What's what's your thought? Yeah, I, I mean, I first wanted to, with, with that particular question, I think it is important that um, to keep in mind that, and I think we've seen this in a lot of ways, that after disasters, there's, there's often this idea that after disaster, there's going to be sort of this human chaos and carnage um, as people sort of scrap for, uh, for scarce resources. And we generally don't see that um, in particularly, you know, in the immediate aftermath of, of disasters. So, so I was really um, sort of inspired by that, that question. Um, but like Tom, I, I, I'm not sure um, what is going to be the most sustainable um, change uh, and behavioral change. Um, I think in some ways, the kinds of conversations that we are having now, and including this very conversation where we are, um, you know, a number of people are able to have, a, to join a, a conversation online is probably something that we should um, be trying to continue, um, both for accessibility reasons, for the fact that it in, in, in includes um, a larger 
a, a larger set of, uh, of, of people who can be in conversation and dialogue with each other. I'm sure many of us on this panel have been in increased dialogue with uh, colleagues around the world uh, in ways that we would never have been able to uh, previously. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I get the very strong sense that some people are, for obvious reasons, very much looking forward to returning to in-person uh, to in-person events. And so while on the one hand, it seems to me like we couldn't possibly go back to solely in-person events, I wouldn't also be surprised if in 10 years we are looking back at the Zoom moment and, and are wondering how we did that for a year and a half. Dar, do you want to come in there? Is that uh, Very briefly, just to say the first thing that's got to go is I think the academic conference model all of a sudden seems like the most indulgent um, model and one that, yeah, I think it starts at home, I think is my point. Um, and when, when I think about the, perhaps the sacrifices that we all need to make towards, I mean, questions of sustainability immediately lead me to think of the climate crisis. And um, I don't think academia will even function in the same manner. However, that leads me to, to think about the bigger questions, of course, about technology and our, our I mean, we have been pushed towards technology over the last year in, in a rapid kind of acceleration of our already rapidly accelerating relationship and dependency on uh, the digital world. And, and I spend a lot of time, not least as a, a new dad um, of an eight month old child and, and thinking about what is the world going to be like for her, um, you know, in, in a social sense and at that interface between the social and the technological, you know, I think... Uh, the last year has made us think a great deal about that relationship between self and, and society. And increasingly that is one that is incredibly awkward. It's, it's one where we're, you know, sheltered in our homes and, and we've been not just physically distanced, but I think socially distanced uh, an, an ironic distinction, of course. Um, and there's, and there's an estrangement there. So um, in one sense, it's inevitable that we're going to be led uh, towards technology and in, in new ways. And, and yet I, I've major, fears about what that does there's nothing sustainable about our current relationship with technology and the way in which smartphones are the medium through which we live love connect and, and consume on an everyday level so there's real tensions there about our connection with technology uh, and, and the environment thank you um there's a question from joy i might uh not get her last name right it's boulevant um Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, and uh, her question is, rebuilding can mean repairing ruins or building anew. Um, and which one do we think we're looking at? Are we going to just be repairing, trying to repair the rubble or are we going to be starting over? Anyone? I've sat back and let others take the first question. So I'll jump straight back in with a very brief answer. But I, I think the reason uh, I'm jumping in first is that I, I don't think it's gonna be either. I think rather than repairing ruins or rebuilding a new, I think we're talking about, and this is quite uh, dystopian, I'm quite a positive person generally, but um, when we're thinking about the relationship between technology and capitalism, um, and we think about who the, uh, and I don't think it's the right thing to say, but winners who are, you know, if there has been opportunities during the, the time of COVID, who has seized on them? Well, I think largely it's been big tech and, and big corporations. And I think that leads us to ask very different questions about the entrenchment of inequalities and kind of the concentration of power um, in ways that mirror the past, I'm afraid. Well, there could be a, a positive way of putting it by saying that these are not ruins and, and and whenever you rebuild after any crisis, you're not building on nothing and you're working with all sorts of existing uh, networks of resilience that already existed. I mean, one of the things that came out of the pandemic for many people were these massive wellsprings of community spirit and mutual aid and a sense of shared purpose and even living through a moment together, which I think did produce something which no doubt can be built upon but I think the task is to point out that even though we have a shared vulnerability through a pandemic like this the, the vulnerability is still a profoundly patterned and I think all of the panelists have said that you know it depends on your age and your job and your upbringing and your race and your gender as to how this 
really plays out. And I think sometimes there was an illusion that because we lived through something together and because there were great reserves of community spirit um, locally, that it necessarily patched people into something bigger. Because very often we were living through something that people like us were living through and we were talking to them about it and we were sharing it with them. And as I said, in the process, borders made a profound difference to that experience. And we're only really seeing the latest phase of that with vaccine nationalism now. So for me, I think the challenge is to bridge that, that sense of togetherness that happened, I think on the small scale and to turn it into something that creates a, a more joined up rather than fragmented narrative. Okay, we've got a question from um, Alex Burke. Now, I'm gonna slightly recast this question, which I hope Alex won't consider too uh, cheeky of me, but we were talking at the beginning about, um, about uh, questioning assumptions and this question has a very strong assumption built into it, which I'm quite sure Alex recognizes. And I'm going to turn that assumption into a question. Um, the way it was uh, framed was, are we in danger of just giving up as things are beyond changing for the better? Um, but I'm going to allow us to question that premise um, as part of the answer. So are uh, things beyond changing for the better? Are we beyond a point as a society where things can change, can change for the better? And, um, and if so, are we in danger of giving up? Anyone? I feel like I'm too much of a pessimist in general by nature <laughs> to, to tackle uh, to tackle this question. Um, but you know, as much as I'm a pessimist by nature, um, history certainly shows us. Um, and you know, to get back to this question of you know our disciplines and and um, and the humanities, um, history certainly shows us that it is. Uh, almost always worth fighting for uh, the sort of vision of society that we imagine. Um, and that, you know, we see this with, you know, various civil rights movements around the world. We are currently seeing that um, with this sort of second wave of, of Black Lives Matter movements from last year, uh, in which there are at the very least sort of conversations that um, are now being had in the United States and in um, the UK uh, that were somewhat unimaginable um, a, a year or so ago. And while you know, we cer certainly wouldn't want to get too carried away in assuming that, you know, having conversations um, or having a lot of sort of chatter on social media uh, equals change. Um, nonetheless, there, there are concepts and political concepts that are in, in conversation that, are, that people are actually advocating and, and um, are, you know, organizing around um, that indicate the importance of fighting, even if like me, you are a pessimist and, and very skeptical, um, that that pessimism shouldn't necessarily override uh, the, the, the need uh, and the importance um, of activism and pushing for, uh, for these visions, uh, these, these more optimistic visions of, of society. Um, to just go off yeah, Christina's please. point, like I think that there's um, like literature and history um, are, showing us is precisely as she talked about like that we sort of have to hold these contradictions in tandem um, and to not simply choose one over the other and that um, particularly with the resurgence of Black Lives Matter but also like this recent turn to anti-Asian racism what you'll hear from experts but also people whose lived experience um, of course speaks to this is that none of this is new and of course we know the historical moments that have been a part of this before or that it's been happening for a long time and people have just not cared and yet people persevere like there has to be this sort of recognition of both um, the fatigue that so many people feel precisely because it is so repetitive, how anti-blackness, um, other forms of racism and so forth. And yet the, there's still much we can learn in terms of being able to push through and again, hold these things in contact. And I think that perhaps the be best way of thinking about change is precisely through a pessimistic angle. Like maybe academics are a little bit pessimistic, but I almost think that the pessimism helped me to prepare for the worst to also hope for the best at the same time. Like I don't think that pessimism as an orientation is actually um, antithetical to, to change or possibility, but I do think perhaps it helps to orient us a little bit differently and to take the time and, sp and space to sort of hope, hopefully move in a way that is more informed. That's, that's at least the hope, but also then when the utopianism shatters, 
we are not so disappointed that we can't pick up the pieces and continue to move on. Yeah, great. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's absurd. I think a lot about um, as I talk about my students too is is that um, we we're trained to think uh, approach the world with skepticism, but skepticism is not radical. It allows our we we can be persuaded. We can be we just ask the question. Um, but then we can see um, it's not an absolute position. So um, I think uh, I think that's absolutely right. Look, we we are um, we are officially out of time. I am uh, or, or winding up. I've been I've been asked not to ask another question, but I'm going to anyway. Um, but and it's a, a really great question from um, the audience, um, and it and it kind of speaks to our um, again our skepticism to build back better. Um, the question is a request for each of you, and so I'm going to ask you to do this as your kind of closing thought. Um, for each of you to offer three key words, and I'm going to say, you know, instead of build back better, it doesn't have to be a slogan, they can be isolated words, but what are the three key words that we should keep in mind when we're thinking about renewing and rebuilding? I'll give you all a second to reflect, and then it's going to have to be slight free association because we don't have enough time for a lot of reflection. <laughs> So, um, three key words. Who is you're all looking down? I can't. I can't do that. Zion, do you feel? Do you feel able to offer three key words about renewing and rebuilding? Um, off the top of my head, it will be a phrase, which is abolition, not reform. Great, Christina. Do you are you ready? I, I, I guess I am, and I'm, I'm sad to, to have to follow uh, Zion's uh, amazing phrase. So mine is not a phrase, it's just, it's literally three random words. Um, curiosity, inclusion, and solidarity. Great. Tom? Well, I immediately thought of uh, my opening point, which was to look in the past, and maybe it could be look to the past, or maybe it could be that crises happened before, and there's an enormous well of experience and examples uh, out there. Thanks. And Dara? Empathy, which is a term I'm surprised we haven't heard uh, more today when we think about the humanities and, and the importance of the humanities in, 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 a, in a moment where numbers and data have come to be kind of numbing uh, to, to the humanizing elements of our culture. And the other two, which I'm not going to uh, do any elaboration, reconnection and critical consciousness. So it's more than three, but <laughs> like, we'll pretend critical consciousness is a compound word that's absolutely fine um thank you uh very much i'm afraid this does bring us to the end of the session so um i only have time left to thank all of you very much for um, a conversation i hugely enjoyed and found really really stimulating and provocative um and i'm sure our audience did as well i'm going to ask everyone um who attended, if you could please do us a favor and complete the evaluation form. The link is just coming into the chat. Um, it will also be circulated by email afterwards. Your, free, your, your feedback um, is incredibly valuable to us and it helps us plan events like this in the future and indeed uh, improve in the ways that we've been talking about. Finally, if you're interested in taking part in our festival this year, our call for applications is currently open on our website at beinghumanfestival.org. So um, thank you all very much for joining me this evening and, um, and for all of your wisdom and uh, um, and, and just, yeah, really um, interesting reflections on the challenges that we're facing. So thank you all very much. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great night.